Hi, Ricardo. Hello, Anand. Nice to see you today. Very good to see you. So today my guest is Ricardo Fukazawa. He's a professor at the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization at the University of Waterloo in Canada. His research interests are in developing theory and computational tools for the exact solution of hard discrete optimization problems, as well as their applications in practical problems. He has contributions in several areas, including integer programming, vehicle routing, stochastic programming, bilevel programming, as well as several applications. Ricardo has publications in several prestigious international journals like Mathematical Programming, Math of OR, Informs Journal on Computing, Mathematical Programming Computation, and Transportation Science. He's an associate editor of Operations Research, OR Letters, Hygo OR, Infor, and a technical editor for Mathematical Programming Computation. Ricardo was a recipient of the IBM Herman Goldstein Postdoctoral Fellowship from 2008 to 2009, and he also won the Early Research Award from the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation. Ricardo, or should I say Fuca, <laughs> it's my pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. No, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here uh, talking to you. I really appreciate uh, all this work that you do. Uh, it's a very good to be here and, and, and in a very prestigious company. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor for me. You know, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, and, you know, so uh, it's a treat to, to, to have you here. So uh, many people here in Brazil, including me, refer to you as Fuca instead of Ricardo. Uh, when did this start? Uh, so this actually started because uh, when I went to uh, primary and, and, and high school, uh, the school that I went to is essentially uh, students are grouped based on first name. Uh, and so there were several Ricardos uh, throughout my class. So people referred to each other as their last names. Uh, and then since Fukazawa is a bit long, they just shortened to Fuka. Uh, and then a lot of the, the kids that were my classmates, they also went to the same university. And, and so the name just stuck. And that's why uh, I think a lot of people just call me Fuka. <laughs> right. It also sounds really cool and sort of a unique, uh, uh, depending <laughs> on the context. Yeah. <laughs> so usually I ask the guests about their parents. But in this case, I think I must ask you about your grandparents first, uh, where they were born. Yeah. So my, all my grandparents, uh, both from my mother and my father's side, they are from Japan. Uh, so they immigrated to Brazil uh, in the 19, uh, between 1910s and 1930s. Uh, and uh, essentially it was because uh, a lot of Japanese actually immigrated to, to Brazil. Um, there were poverty going on in, in, in Japan. And at the same time, Brazil had not so recently like, ended slavery. They were needing people to... Uh, work on the fields, uh, and so they were bringing a lot of people, uh, including the Japanese, to, to work there uh, with a promise of having like, a great life and so on, and so that's why, why my grandparents came to Brazil. Uh, and my parents, they were already born in Brazil, but uh, for, so they're first generation uh, Brazilian. Right. Uh, did they come to Sao Paulo? Because there's a huge uh, Japanese colony. Uh, yes, yes. So they 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 came to the the countryside of São Paulo. Uh, so my mom was born in a small city called Guararapes, and uh, my father is is born in Linz, which is also close by in a, another small city there. Uh, but they moved to the main city, the capital, São Paulo, uh, to to study. Mm -hmm. And uh, what were your parents' occupation? Uh, so my father, he did uh, his undergrad in uh, electronic engineering. Uh, he studied at ITA, which is the uh, institute, technical institute of the uh, aeronautics, which is very a very strong school uh, in Brazil. 
Uh, my mother, she did, uh, she studied at PUC, which is sort of the same university that I did, but it, the one in Sao Paulo. Uh, and she did uh, mathematics. Uh, and she went on to, to become uh, a teacher in, uh, in public schools in, in Brazil. Uh, and my father went on to actually, I mean, he spent a couple of years at GE, uh, but then he spent essentially his whole uh, professional career at IBM. Uh, he started there, I think, as a systems analyst uh, and then started moving up the ladder and, and retired. Mm -hmm. um, any sisters or brothers? Yes, I have uh, two older sisters, uh, one four and five years older than me. Um, they also like, like uh, the exact area, so the, the more technical areas, I would say, like math uh, and, and engineering. So they're both uh, actual engineers. Do they still live in Brazil? They do, yes. One of them lives in Rio. Uh, one of them lives uh, lives in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. She okay. went back to Sao Paulo to work. Mm, right. Uh, to what extent you have been influenced by the Japanese culture in your life? Um, I think it's it's probably been something that's been present, uh, but in a, in a a bit of a, a subconscious way. It's not something that I was like actively looking at every day, but it's like. Uh, small traits in personality i would say that that's like uh, behaving like typically like like japanese uh do they're a little bit more i guess introverts uh but also things like culinary uh, my mother used to cook things well not explicitly japanese dishes there she always put a bit of a japanese twist to it um we were always speaking while i don't actually speak japanese itself but we were like speaking some Japanese words uh, on everyday life, um, like saying good morning, saying thank you, and, and, and things like that. Um, so it was like small things that were sort of inserted in my daily life that I probably didn't even realize uh, that sort of shaped who I am uh, today. Right. Uh, you were born in Rio in 1977. But you spent a period abroad when you were a kid, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I was born in Rio uh, and spent pretty much my whole life there. Uh, I spent two years uh, from two to four years old. Uh, I lived in uh, the Netherlands, actually, because my father uh, had a, a short assignment there for two years. Um, so I lived there. I don't remember much because I was so young. Uh, but I've seen a lot of pictures there, and uh, um, and in some ways I think that uh, that helped me a bit also with like developing better language skills because when I was there, uh, I was learning. Uh, I was sort of in preschool, but it was like an English speaking preschool, um, so I had a good exposure to to other languages at a very young age too. Mm -hmm. uh where did you grow up in Rio? Yeah, so f until I was about five years of age, well, obviously taking off the, 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 the time in the, the Netherlands, uh, we had a house uh, in a, a, a neighborhood, which is actually the, like right next to where the soccer team Fluminense is. Uh, so we lived there for until I was about five years old. Uh, and then we moved to Barra da Tijuca which is on the west part of Rio, uh, which at the time was like really, really empty uh, and then uh, started getting developed. And uh, today it's, it's like a completely different part of the city with, with tons more of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the day it was like pretty much us and, and our neighbors <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, now it looks like Miami. It's all yes, crowded. Exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, were you a top student in school? Uh, yeah, I was always a, a very good student. Um, my wife always makes fun of me that, uh, I, I didn't have any friends, uh, playing with me because, uh, in, in my school, uh, if you passed, uh, with us a, a grade above a certain level, uh, you didn't need to go to the final exams. 
So you just passed straight away. So you went on vacation like a month earlier. And so my wife's like, oh, oh, you never actually had to do the final exam. You were the only one there. And so you didn't have any friends to play with <laughs> because everybody was studying for the finals. Um, so yeah, I, I was always a, a very good student. That's excellent. Uh, other than school, how did you spend your time back in the day? Uh, so the good thing about uh, living uh, in Baja, where we lived, is that uh, we lived right in front of the beach. Um, so I, I used to go to the beach a lot. Um, it also, uh, the way sort of a lot of what uh, Baja is structured is they, they have uh, condominiums, but uh, I guess not really like condominiums that the people are used to maybe in the US and Canada, which is just a single building. It's actually a set of buildings uh, with a common area fenced in uh, and there they have uh, like places to play soccer, places to, to go. I mean, there's a pool usually, there's markets. So there's a whole infrastructure uh, inside this, this sort of building complex. Uh, and so that's where I spend my days so just going there. Uh, playing tennis, playing with my friends, going to the beach, uh, playing soccer. So mm -hmm. that, that those were, were my go-to things. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned tennis. Uh, did you have a favorite player at the time? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always liked uh, Agassi, both uh, with hair and without hair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I liked uh, also on the women's side, I like uh, Steffi Graf. Uh, I liked uh, Justine Henan. Um, and then later on, obviously, I started with uh, Guga. Um, Guga was like, coming up and, and, and winning majors and so on. Uh, and then obviously after uh, I started watching Federer, uh, and then he became also one of my favorite players too. Yeah, yeah, he's great, of course. Um, is it true that you were a black belt in karate? Uh, yes, uh, it is actually true. Uh, I became a black belt uh, in uh, Shotokan style uh, of karate back in Brazil. Uh, and then I started becoming a little bit uh, busy with life and studying and everything. So I, I started, uh, it started becoming hard to, to be training every day. So I stopped for a while. Uh, but then when I actually moved back to Canada, um, I found a dojo here as well. Uh, but in the, actually it's in a slightly different style, uh, which is uh, called Goju Ryu. Uh, and then I started training again here, uh, starting from white belt from, from the very beginning. But then I became a black belt here again in, in Goju Ryu. So, yes, uh, <laughs> I, I actually am tw twice a black belt. Uh, right. Karate. How long did it take for you to become a black belt in Brazil and in Canada? Uh, probably both about 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. And what motivated you to start practicing karate? Um, it was funny, actually. It was, uh, I think, at the time when the, 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 the first Karate Kid movie mm. uh, came out. Uh, and then I looked at that and I was all excited. And I was, oh, this is so cool and so on. It's like such a skinny guy. And I was like, also skinny. And, and, and he's like, doing all this cool stuff. Uh, and then I started actually doing a lot of that in my house, and like doing that to my sisters and doing that to like the furniture. And my mom just got mad and said, you know what, stop that. If you really want to do this, go take a class and, and don't do that in the house. Go do that in, in, in the actual class. And so she put me in a karate class um, and then I started doing it and I started liking it each time more. So. That, that that's how I started. Mm, so now you're Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would hope, but uh, no, nowhere near. <laughs> right. Uh, do you watch Cobra Kai, by the way, the series? Uh, I watched. I didn't watch the, the the full series. I watched, I guess, of the couple of uh, of new seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was nice, like nostalgic, but I guess I mean, it wasn't quite the same. So. Uh -huh. I wasn't as excited, but uh, it was it was good to sort of see back a few of the 
of, of the old characters that, that sparked the interest. For yeah, it's a lot of nostalgia there. Uh, and like the series, uh, were you able to engage your kids in, in karate too? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, uh, I sort of uh, put my son in, in karate for uh, a few years as well. Uh, essentially, we just wanted to, to make him like do some exercise and then try to stick to something. Uh, and he at the beginning, he was OK, but uh, I think with time he started actually not liking it as much. Uh, the, the, like the really strict, uh, rules of karate, having to repeat the same thing over and over again, uh, to, to like become perfect. So he started not really enjoying it. He ended up leaving, uh, my daughters actually, we tried a few times to see if they would even like, but they didn't even start. So uh, okay. we decided to not push it with them either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, perfectionism. Uh, do you consider yourself as a perfectionist? Uh, yes, yes, I do. I, and I think that's that's one of the things that uh, sort of drives me or, or draws me to uh, to these types of sports, to to tennis, to karate. Uh, it's the the need to be like really precise. Tennis, if you hit the ball five inches or five millimeters, even like wrong way, the ball is going to go out. Uh, in karate, you have to be really precise, hand movements, and you train over and over again. So I think that that's really what draws me to these types of sports. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and, and, and I've had to learn to, to dial that down a bit as well uh, through my life uh, to, 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 to be able to sort of have a, a a good relationship with some people that are not as perfectionist so <laughs> yeah i understand <laughs> uh were you interested in music uh yes yeah I, I was uh i was interested in music um i mean my parents they put me in uh, piano lessons uh, uh early on as well uh but actually i hated piano uh, the, I think part of it was because the, 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 the types of musics that I was always exposed to were like classic music, which I hated at the time. Uh, I don't know if it's a style of teaching. Um, we would even sometimes, it was like me and my sisters doing the, the, the lessons. And sometimes uh, the piano teacher would come in one door. We would actually go out to the kitchen door to sort of say, oh, we weren't here and try <laughs> to miss uh, the piano lessons. Uh, but I think that helped me actually a lot to to gain a bit more of like musical theory, a little develop a little bit of better uh, musical ear as well. Um, and then uh, after a bit uh, during my teenage years, I started picking up uh, guitar, uh, acoustic guitar. I tried to I started to take lessons, uh, and then uh, also started to play the saxophone later on. Wow, saxophone. Uh, but why the saxophone? <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, it, this is uh, it, it's a, a bit funny story, too. Uh, I mean, I, I, I always like to play and then I, I wanted to hang out with my friends and they were starting this band. Uh, so but they had already two lead guitarists, so I couldn't be the third one. They already had a bass guitarist as well, so there can be a, 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 another second bass guitarist. They had a drummer. Uh, and so I was like, OK, maybe I could do something to, to be in the band. And, and so I started, oh, what if I play the saxophone? I, I thought it was a cool instrument anyways to learn. Uh, but in some ways, it was a way to, to try to, uh, to get in that band and, and, and be with my friend and hang out and, and, and play around. So that's how it started. Mm. Uh, and, and what did you guys play? Uh, did you perform live? Uh, yeah, we played uh, essentially just rock, uh, Brazilian rock, uh, some, uh, some uh, English or some international rock. Um, at the beginning, we were just playing and, and uh, playing like in, in barbecues that we would have in, in my friend's house and so on to our friends. 
but then we started saying, hey, you know what, why not? Let's just play around. So we actually played in a, in a couple of nightclubs uh, in, in Copacabana. Um, we had we played cover uh, songs, but we also had some original songs that our, our lead guitarist uh, wrote. Uh, we ended up doing, I think, and that was already when, when we were in college, we actually played uh, in an event that we had organized in, a, in a, the house of the drummer. Uh, it's like sold tickets to it and, and, and there were like 300 people or something. So yeah, we did some concerts. Uh, we recorded like demo tapes as well. Um, so it was, it was a fun thing to do for a while. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, of course it's a hobby, but you guys uh, went to another level at some point too. And this is very interesting. I had no idea about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a nice hobby to, to I guess, most of us. Uh, actually, I, I think one of the lead guitarists actually is, is still works to this day with music. Uh -huh. uh, so for him, it actually became a profession, uh, but, but it was, yeah, it was a fun hobby that we could take a bit to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned Brazilian rock, uh, and also English, uh, bands and what did you like to listen and, uh, which bands you, you guys, uh, used to play covered songs? Uh, so I, I like to listen to, uh, MPB, which is, uh, I guess to translate to English would be like Brazilian pop music um but that popular which, music is not uh, it's not uh, the the pop that we're uh kind of yeah, 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 yeah i it's think more it, uh brazilian music in in its essence not uh, the the pop way of thinking right now uh of, of this type i of agree thing. yeah yeah it it, it does uh, it does do it a little bit of a disservice to what it is because you think pop you think maybe k-pop or some things like yeah. that uh, and yeah, so Brazilian pop music is, is like uh, with uh, tons of, of Brazilian influence uh, with a little bit of samba, a little bit of bossa nova, and a little bit of rock. And, and Yeah, we're talking about Gilberto Gil, Caetano Veloso, Chico Buarque, those Exactly, those guys, yeah. yes, uh, those guys. Yeah, I liked uh, very much also one, one a group called Boca Livre. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like, they do very beautiful harmonies, harmonies with... Yes. Uh, yeah, with vocal harmonies, so that that's a very nice uh, group as well. Uh, and but it, I guess we didn't play that those guys that much in in the band. In the band, we played more of, of rock, which are also a, a Brazilian rock, like Paralamas, do Sucesso, uh, like Lulu Santos, like uh, Legião Urbana, Barão Vermelho, Martin probably. Rolls. Barão Vermelho, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, uh, and then, uh, I mean, I myself liked uh, Eric Clapton as well uh, as uh, to, to, like, to more the, the English or the international, the English speaking uh, types of, of rock, uh, Dire Straits um, and, uh, and also Rush. So it's a very, uh, very nice band that, uh, that I like. Wow, if you had mentioned Beatles, that would be my... Uh top three favorite bands, <laughs> uh, Beatles, Rush and Dire Straits. Uh, I'm very surprised to know that uh, I mean, you, you enjoy them. I was about to ask you exactly that since you're in uh, Ontario, uh, if, you, if you like Rush because uh, they're originally from Toronto. Um, so did you have the chance to attend the, uh, some of their concerts before they retired? Yes, so I was actually very fortunate. I, I actually, I mean, I started listening to, to Rush uh, in, in my teenage years uh, back in Brazil. Uh, it was actually one of the, my, my sister's boyfriend that introduced me to it. Uh, uh, and I, I loved it, like from the, the very beginning. So I was very fortunate to, to attend uh, one or to go to, to their concert uh, in Rio. I think the Russian Rio, what, what it's called. Um, it was at the time I was like, it was a dream come true to, to be able to go to the concert. They did a DVD uh, out and, of that concert. Yes, yes, they did. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to, I mean, I moved here. So I was like, oh, I'm very close. And, and I was able to attend also the, uh, the, the R40 concert here uh, in uh, I think at the time was called the Air Canada Center, but yeah. in any case, in, in Toronto. 
um so yeah i was very lucky to be able to see them live yeah i also saw them live in in 2010 i was doing phd in niterai which was next door right uh in, in yeah so uh, it was also a dream come true it was uh, fantastic uh yeah i like to compare progressive rock bands uh, like rush for example to or because uh few people really understand what's going on uh but uh those who are able to appreciate the technicalities if you will uh i get really passionate about it right <laughs> oh yeah that that's a good point yeah i never <laughs> thought of it that way but yeah <laughs> it's a very good analogy yeah uh why did you decide to study engineering at book hill uh it wasn't like a very well thought of decision i would say um it was just i really like math i was like the, my my best and my favorite subject uh, i like physics uh, i like chemistry uh so typically for that type of profile the the default choice is to actually do engineering um so that's sort of what i did i just said okay that's what everybody does so it it seems to be good it seems to have Uh, interesting options so that's what I decided to do mm -hmm. um, at least as far as engineering goes uh, and then uh, I did the vestibular the the entrance exam uh, to book uh, and then to the Federal University of Rio uh, and then uh, I had applied to do the, the state university as well but I ended up even not doing because I already had the results for the, the two previous ones um and then it was a matter of just deciding which of the two uh i was going to get into um the federal university i was uh, i got a very good uh, score in, in the entrance exam i was third overall wow um but i i also was able to get like 20 i think 21st or 22nd uh in book uh which meant that i would uh maybe be eligible for a scholarship uh, the top 20 get eligible eligible for a scholarship but then i think a couple uh, of the top 20 decided to go elsewhere mm -hmm. uh, so i ended up being in the top 20 uh, so i got a, a scholarship to book uh, and that's that's how i decided to go there mm -hmm. okay uh and what was your first academic project um so i actually started liking so in, in PUC you 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 go into the basic courses for all engineers um and then i started liking um the electrical part or the the, the electronic part uh and then i did what was called um like a scientific initiation project that's what it's called uh where uh, I, we actually had to build a robot uh so that's I, i thought it was a really cool thing to do uh but at that time you didn't have these things that you have these days like a, a microchip that you could put like in a robot things that fit in your wallet or stuff like that like a very small thing uh so what we had to do is we essentially built the the logic of the the the, the robot basically an analog form uh it was a very simple thing just trying to do essentially like uh maybe what a Roomba does these days in a much more efficient way but it's just navigating through a room and trying not to hit walls mm -hmm. uh, so we just put sensors to see okay if, if it senses a wall or not and if it sends the wall it, it opened the relay or it closed the relay and then that's like activated or deactivated motors and that's what made the robot sort of go around and try to avoid a few objects uh, so it was all like in the analog form uh, but but it was a very fun project to do mm -hmm. okay and how did you learn about or uh so at at my university there were uh or courses uh, because it was like what they call the decision support systems uh track uh, and so that's how i started because i took uh, a basic lp and ip course uh, with uh, oscar porto which uh, eventually became uh, my advisor uh, in the electrical engineering department 
Uh, and I started looking at that and I said, wow, this is really cool. This is like really something else. You can start uh, doing a lot of these nice things and solve a lot of uh, very interesting problems with this. Uh, and so that's my first contact. Uh, and then I started taking a few other courses. I took courses uh, with Claudia Sargassi-Sabal, with uh, Billy Lucena. So a lot of uh, very good uh, names that are back in Brazil. Right, so I, I took courses with them, and I started falling in love and and, and figuring out uh, how nice it is, how cool it is, all this this mm -hmm. stuff that we can do in the war. So. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Oscar Porto, uh, he's from Argentina, actually, uh, and yes. I was talking uh, with him last week, and uh, uh, I told that I was going to, uh, you know, have you on subject two and things like that, and then uh, he shared a, a very nice anecdote that. Uh, by the time that you, you were taking his course, uh, he was still calibrating the level of the exams. And uh, it seems that only two students out of 40 uh, actually did not fail in the exam. And you were one of the, uh, the oh. two students that did not <laughs> fail. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but re he, he remembers you really fondly. I mean, he likes you very much. So uh, it was nice to know yeah. this. Uh, did you spend a period abroad during the undergrad? Yeah, so close to, I think it was 99, 2000, I spent uh, six months uh, doing a, a, an exchange in the UCSB, uh, University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, so it was a great experience to be there and, and, and seeing like what, what is it to study abroad and then uh, having contact with uh, several different people. Uh, and uh, at, at that time, I was still sort of undecided as, as far as what I would uh, I would do. Um, so I took some uh, robotics courses there. Uh, I still was a bit interested in that. Uh, I looked for like OR type courses. I did it wasn't like optimization really courses, but they had like time series and, and some other statistics courses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took those as well there. Um, to, to, to try to help me figure out really where did I want to go with, with my career. Right. Uh, it should have been an enriching experience, right? For the first time uh, studying abroad and being, getting used to an international environment uh, probably also had a nice impact on you, right, later on? For sure, yes. It was a, it was very, a very enriching experience uh, to, to go out of my comfort zone, uh, be uh out uh, essentially in a completely different environment uh with something i'm not used to teaching styles that i'm not used to seeing different people uh so it was very very uh good for me to mature uh, as a person uh, and mature my ideas and figure out what i really wanted mm -hmm. to do with my life for sure right and did you have to to write a, a bachelor thesis to earn your degree uh, so yeah, I did a, a, a like it wasn't a, a thesis itself, but you had to do like a, a project uh, at the end of the course, uh, and I did it uh, on on uh, OR problems uh, on on railroads. Uh, that's sort of wh where I finished my uh, my undergrad degree, uh, mm -hmm. already having decided to go to the OR route. Ah, okay. Uh... You witness the birth of Gapso around that time. Uh, Gapso later became one of the most relevant OR companies in Latin America. Uh, tell me more about your role in the company and also if you have any recollections about how the company started. Yeah, so it was actually, it was a good timing that uh, I was sort of finishing my undergrad, deciding what to do. Uh, and Gapso was starting, uh, Oscar, which, which was my advisor at the time, and, and then Marcus Poggi, uh, which was, became also my advisor, a co-advisor in, in Masters, right? Uh, they were starting this company uh, that, to do OR, really applied and, and, and put it uh, into companies there. Uh, so I decided to do my Masters uh, on, on also projects uh, with Gapso as well. 
uh, and that that's where I started. Uh, and at the very beginning, it was like really just four people, uh, both Oscar and Marcus, and then me and Cristiano, uh, which was another student as well. Uh, so it's like a really, really small thing. And we were just sitting in an office. Uh, I mean, we had both me and Cristiano on one side, uh, Marcus and, and Oscar in, in the other side. Uh, and then we were just there like solving the problems, everything that had to be done, we needed to do. Uh, we developed uh, interface, we went to clients, trying to sell the product, trying to sort of educate the clients into what OR was. Uh, and also uh, make the, the, the actual project itself, the, the actual OR tools to solve the problem. Uh, so we, we did it, essentially we did it all. Uh, so it's a very nice thing to sort of see this thing grow from from this being like a four person operation uh, to the size that it that actually it eventually became. Uh, it, it's it was really, really uh, an amazing thing to do mm -hmm. to see. Right. Uh, in the end, you you chose to follow the academic path. But I think this experience uh, in the industry was really helpful uh, somehow in, in your career, too. Right. For sure. Yes, it was it was good for me to sort of decide what actually I needed to do or what I wanted to do, uh, because during this time on my master's, I started realizing which were the parts that uh, of what I was doing that I was liking. Uh, and I started figuring out that the parts that I really liked uh, were probably more in line with an academic career. Uh, with just being able to pick a problem apart and, and just do study it uh, deeply and try to make sure uh, that you can solve it as best as, as you can. Uh, that was the part that I liked. Uh, and so that's how I decided, you know what, uh, I think this, uh, this company thing is, is nice. It has uh, like a, a good environment and so on. And I was enjoying but the part that really attracted me uh, was was the more academic part. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I decided to do my PhD. What did you do in your master's in terms of research? Yeah, I continued doing research on, on the railroad uh, problems uh, with uh, using optimization tools. Uh, I developed a lot further what I had done uh, at the end ah. of my undergrad. I just developed it a lot further. Okay. Uh, so the paper that I probably read the most during my PhD was the famous robust branch cut and price for the capacitated vehicle routing problem by uh, a guy called Ricardo Fukazawa and all the authors, of course, uh, many of them. <laughs> um, can you tell the story behind that work from your perspective? Yeah, so... It was, uh, to me, I was, I consider myself very fortunate to have been uh, at the right time uh, and at the right place. Uh, we were in one of these trips that we were doing with, uh, with Gapso. Uh, we were also talking about uh, like other problems and so on. And we said, well, maybe we should, I mean, they proposed to me that we, we should like, do something maybe on the, on the vehicle routing problem. Uh, and then I think we were at the airport, we were discussing like a few things, a few ideas, and, and then the idea started to come, the initial idea that, that eventually matured. Uh, and, and so I was like really fortunate to just be in there and part of that discussion. Um, and at the time I didn't even like realize probably completely uh the importance of it uh and 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 the impact that it would have uh so uh, it, it just started from that very simple idea that that, that started to get developed uh and mature uh and so i, I was uh, it was really a, a matter of being at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and how was the experience of working with eduardo Shaw? Oh, it was great. It was great. Yeah, Eduardo was was one of the people that uh, really instilled in me this uh, this drive to 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 be uh, be doing the best that you can in terms of coding, in terms of uh, obsessing about a problem, uh, thinking so much about it that you end up uh, dreaming of the problem. 
Uh, he used to say, if you're not dreaming about the problem, you're, you're not thinking about it uh, enough. Uh, and, and it became something really that, that I took to heart. So it was a great experience. Uh, and he was a really hands-on type of, of, of advisor as well, that he would look and see, okay, this is what you're doing in the code and, and it's probably not the right way. So he would actually like be uh, at uh, my side, like looking at stuff that we was doing and, and seeing how things could be developed. Uh, so he taught me a lot to how to do things more efficiently uh, and how to to have that drive to to yes uh, to I, look at problems. I can totally relate because I've also been I had a chance to be part of the, a similar process. So yeah, I totally agree with you. And and why did you decide to do a PhD in the U.S. and why Georgia Tech? So uh, I. I decided to do the PhD because I, I felt like I, I needed the background to th that I was lacking a bit. Uh, and then I decided to go abroad because I, I thought it was a good way also to, to expand my horizons. I think probably being at Santa Barbara uh, gave me a little bit of a taste to, to, to go outside and, and pursue new things. Um, and, and so that's how I, I decided to, to do this first step, do a PhD abroad. And uh, I ended up applying to uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, MIT, uh, Columbia, and uh, Rutgers. Uh, and I was fortunate enough that, that I was, uh, I got an offer from everybody except Rutgers. Um, and then the decision to go to Georgia Tech was essentially done because of the visit. So they, they organized the visit for prospective students. Uh, and I went to all four places uh, that had accepted me. Uh, and uh, I think Georgia Tech was the one that that felt uh, right at the end after this visit. Mm -hmm. uh, were you married uh, by the time you reached the US? Uh, I was very recently married. So uh, I had been dating my, my now wife. Uh, for quite a few years. Uh, and then when we took this decision, I mean, we took the decision to, to go abroad uh, in the PhD. We took the decision together um, and uh, she supported me all the way. So uh, then we decided, but we were still living in our parents' house and we didn't see that it made sense to sort of get married uh, too much in advance and still live in our parents' house because we, we wouldn't have money to, to get a, our own house. So we just decided to get married the day before we were actually flying to the US. Uh, so, so literally one day before we got married, next day we flew uh, and, and moved to Atlanta. Yeah, and you spent your honeymoon by yourself uh, in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, 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 that's... Uh, uh, one of the things that, that, that my wife uh, uh, always uh, teases me about is that uh, it was the, the time of the uh, 2003 ISMP. Uh, and at that time, I was, uh, I was, doing, I was going to present the, the work that I was doing for the VRP uh, for the first time there. Uh, Bill Cook generously uh, offered to pay for that trip, even though it wasn't... Uh, uh, his work with him, uh, and so I went. What well, was my first conference presenting in a prestigious uh, conference and, and, and to everybody, so I had to go, but it was like essentially a week after we arrived in Atlanta. Uh, so, so it was, yeah, our, our honeymoon was spent uh, <laughs> with me and ISMP. So, yes. Yeah, in Denmark, right? In Denmark, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I heard your wife had a very interesting occupation in Brazil. Uh, yes, she used to work in uh, movie production, uh, so she was an assistant to the producer. Uh, she did, uh, for those uh, Brazilians that, that know, she did uh, the, most of the Shusha movies. Uh, she was involved in, in the production of those. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, so I asked you about the experience of working with Ushua and what about uh, Bill Cook? 
Yeah, so Bill Cook was uh, also a, a, an excellent person to work with. Uh, I think similar uh, in a way of having this drive to 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 do very good computations, to do things uh, in a very uh, methodical uh, and and like obsessing about a problem as well. Uh, but he was a little bit more hands off uh, than what Eduardo was. Uh, which I think uh, helped me a lot as well to become a more independent researcher. Uh, helped me a lot to sort of develop uh, my own ideas. So I would typically go and talk to Bill, uh, and then it was amazing how fast he would just like okay, figure out what was at the heart of the question, uh, and and point out the very key questions that we should be thinking about. And they were like, OK, yeah, very good question. And we started thinking. And then we said, I mean, based on that, we developed a lot of things. And then a couple of weeks later, we would go back and present to him again. Uh, so in that sense, it was a different style uh, of supervision um, that I think helped develop a whole uh, different aspect as well uh, of, of what you need to do to do mm -hmm. good research. Mm -hmm. uh what was your strategy to learn advanced integer programming other than studying really hard, of course? Uh, yeah, so it was, as I said, right, it was something that I was looking for to try to complement uh, the, the, the lack of knowledge that I had. Uh, so I just started trying to figure out what is it that, that would be a good thing to learn uh, that would help not only, I guess, not necessarily just integer programming, uh, but more in general, like the mathematical foundations of, of learning, uh, even different fields, right, of optimization, having a bit better idea, for example, of, of nonlinear programming as well. Uh, so I did, for example, a couple of courses uh, at Georgia Tech uh, that were even at the undergrad level uh, because I felt that uh, I didn't have these courses uh, in my undergrad, so I thought, well, I should probably do that. So I took analysis, I took topology of Euclidean spaces, uh, these types of courses that uh, that I wouldn't have taken otherwise. And, and uh, that's that was my strategy, to try to figure out where is the hole and, and go after trying to fill this hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's really hard to grasp uh, the theory and the concepts uh, related to, to optimization when you go more into the uh, mathematical level. Uh, do you think that the fact that you had a practical experience coding a uh, brush cutting price algorithm gave you a sort of an edge to, to understand the concepts related to mathematical optimization? Um, I, I wouldn't say that it gave me an edge to understand the concepts. Uh, to me, the, the, that helped me uh, contextualize a little bit better and try to identify uh, what are the things uh, that are important to be asking. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the key things that uh, probably would make something work better? Where are the areas uh, that, that you would uh, need to improve? Uh, and that's where I started developing. I think that's, to me, it's also something that is very valuable to have both the theory and the computational aspect together. And that's still something I strive to do to this day because I think they, they complement each other very well. So I typically f start looking at a problem, uh, start trying to play around with it, implement, uh, and see, okay, what are the things that probably would make it work a little bit better? And then that gives you idea of things to ask. And then that and then you look at theory, develop that theory, uh, and then you go back and put it in practice and it creates a, a virtuous cycle uh, of research, which I found very valuable. Mm, right. Uh, how about the exams? Uh, did you pass with flying colors? <laughs> uh, no, I think at Georgia Tech, it was uh, it was really hard uh, to 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 do the exams. Uh, I passed, I wouldn't say with flying colors, <laughs> uh, but it was it was a very trying time, which was good because it, it made me learn a lot. Uh, I remember a, a few instances where um, 
I, we used like spent weeks trying to work on homework problems and uh, and and just trying to to grind and, and understand all the basic concepts. Um, I even like remember there was one oral exam that we did uh, that we had when I was doing integer programming uh, with Nemhauser, which was an amazing thing to have study. Uh, Nemhauser Wolsey book with Nemhauser, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we, but they had an oral exam, uh, and at the time it was uh, actually Karen Ardell and, and George Nemhauser, which were teaching the, the, the course together. And in the oral exam, uh, George was actually uh, asking, "Oh, can you write down the formula for the MIR inequality?" And I tried and I fumbled and I was like, oh, actually, I, I can't do this. <laughs> I, I eventually gave up. And then uh, it was funny that Karen actually turned to George and said, you know, George, I, I also can't. <laughs> <laughs> and so George said, OK, maybe maybe this was too much. <laughs> Uh, that's that's very nice. Uh, I know your first son was born uh, when you were still doing uh, the PhD. Uh, how did that affect your routine? Uh, it was it was tricky to to try to uh, balance uh, personal life uh, and, and professional life. Uh, so at that time, I was actually close to doing my comprehensive exams at Georgia Tech. So I remember like studying sometimes with my son in my lap. I was like doing exercises and so on. And, and at the same time uh, with my son in my lap. So it was it was very tricky. But uh, I mean, it's 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 stuff you do, right? You need, you need to do what you have to do uh, to get through it. So uh, it was OK. I survived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what was your PhD research about? Uh, the thesis was about knapsack cuts in general, which, uh, I mean, I guess not just knapsack cuts, but uh, cuts derived from uh, a single row relaxation. Um, so we talked about knapsack cuts, we talked about uh, gomery cuts uh, computed in a safe way, uh, and we talked also about um, the master equality polyhedron, which was a generalization of Gomery's group polyhedron. Uh, and so we just had a collection of these together, uh, and that was my thesis. Yeah, it sounds complex. Uh, it, I mean, I, I took a look at some of the papers, and it's, you know, there's a real uh, strong theoretical foundation, and, you know, uh, it, it's not that easy to digest. Uh, Right. Yeah, it was it was tricky to come up with it as well. <laughs> so yeah, it took it took quite some time uh, and long hours, and uh, they, we had I mean theory, but also some more computational chapters. Uh, I, I'm not even sure which one was harder. Uh -huh. uh, they were they were all very hard. Uh, so, but I think at the end of the day, it was a thesis also that encompasses. Uh, this philosophy a bit of having both theory and computations together. Um, you had uh, the opportunity to spend a period at, at at and during your PhD. Uh, once again, uh, you had very good company. Uh, what did you do there? Yeah, so I was uh, I did a summer internship uh, with uh, David Applegate uh, at at and uh, We were working on some uh, routing problems, not vehicle routing, but like a, like telecommunications packet routing problems. Uh, yeah, we tried a bit, a few ideas. I guess at the end of the day, none of it worked too well, uh, but it was a great experience to be there working with David, seeing how he thinks and, and how he operates also. Uh, it, it's amazing, mm -hmm. it's a very smart person too. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, sorry. What happened after you completed your PhD? Uh, and then after I completed my PhD, I mean, I, I had done also a, an internship at IBM uh, later on. Ah, okay. With Sanjeev. Yeah, working with Sanjeev and Octai. Uh, and so after I finished my PhD, I, I applied to the, the Goldstein uh, postdoc there uh, and I was accepted. Uh, so I went to spend uh, one year at IBM, which was like one of the best uh, research years I probably the best period in my research career. 
um, because I had already actually also uh, interviewed at Waterloo and, and, and had an offer from Waterloo, which I just deferred for a year. Um, so I essentially was done with courses, was done with thesis, was done with everything that students need to be done. Uh, also didn't have to look for a job because I already get, had a job in, in guaranteed for the year after I finish. Uh, and also I didn't have any of the faculty obligations, committees and so on. Uh, so I really was just one year that I dedicated to research. So it was, it was an amazing period uh, to spend uh, at IBM during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you collaborated with Duchoa again and also Arthur Pessoa during that time, correct? Yes, we decided to, to work a bit on the, the time-dependent uh, traveling salesman problem. Uh, it probably is a bad name to be called time dependent, more sequence dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but we decided to to start looking at that type of problem, uh, and, and uh, we did some uh, theoretical studies and, and some implementations as well for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, one curiosity is that I was working on a particular case of that problem uh, together with a dear friend of mine, uh, Marcos Melo Silva, and we provided a couple of upper bounds for your exact algorithm. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think Eduardo had mentioned that, yes, we, we got some upper bounds. Yeah, we were working more on the dual side of things and, and we needed upper bounds for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, and soon after you joined Waterloo, I don't know if you remember, but you did us a great favor uh, in 2010 by presenting uh, our work in a conference in Italy because uh, none of us could, could make it. So I don't know if you remember that event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I do. Uh, because, we, uh, yeah, the story is that uh, I was presenting at that conference this work that I had done with Eduardo on the, on the TDTSP. Uh, but Eduardo, at the last minute, I don't remember why, but he was, oh, I actually can't go. But I have this other work at the same conference. Would you be able to present it for me? And I was like, well, I guess so. <laughs> uh, I just had a look very quickly at the slides. It makes sense to me. And he explained to me a bit what was there. Uh, and so it, it was a, a weird but funny, but funny experience uh, to, to be presenting a work that's not my own. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I explained everything and, and, and people asked questions. But, uh, and then I, I probably referred most of them to, to, to the original authors. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for doing that, by the way. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, you, you mentioned that you got an offer from Waterloo. Uh, did you apply elsewhere? Uh, I applied to, to, uh, yeah, several different places, but, uh, I actually just got an offer. The only, uh, faculty position that I got an offer from was Waterloo. Um, so it was like 2008, uh, the, the market, I guess, wasn't uh, as great. Um, so that that's, that's the only place that I got an offer from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my dad uh, did his PhD uh, at the University of Waterloo. I had the chance to visit oh, the yeah. university in 1993. Uh, yeah, so it was uh, nice. And I, I, I remember it was a very nice campus as well. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, it, I'm really glad uh, you were able to, to, to find a position there. Um, so up to that point in time, you stood on the shoulders of several giants. Uh, I think you will, uh, you will agree with me, right? Uh, For sure, yes. Yeah. Uh, how was the process of becoming an independent researcher uh, and what were your main scientific contributions of the last 10 years or so? Uh, so it was, yeah, it was a, a difficult process to, to start uh, trying to develop my uh, my own style and my own uh, contribution by myself, right? Uh, but it was something that I consciously tried to make an effort from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, it was an advice that I received to, to sort of try not to stick too much to uh, working with the people that advised you before, um, to really make sure that, that whatever you developed is is your own thing uh, so it was with time i started to to develop my own style and uh, 
what I started to decide to do was to, to start to build on, on what, I, uh, what I know uh, and then uh, use that as a platform to start branching out a bit. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we start, I started working on different variants of, of vehicle routing, uh, a few of them uh, considering, for example, energy considerations, and then from there we branched a bit into uh, problems with nonlinear objective functions, uh, like the pollution routing problem. I know that problem well. <laughs> Speeds. Yes, yeah, you also had some work there. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, you profit from some upper bounds too. <laughs> I can't. Sure, <laughs> it seems to be a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, where, where but with essentially you have like a convex objective that's non-linear uh, on the speed that, that you traverse arcs. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, I started also getting interested in, in uh, working with uncertainty. Uh, so I started working on uh, stochastic vehicle routing. We did a, a few works there uh, with chance constraint vehicle routing and then uh, with two-stage vehicle routing. Uh, and then from there, the things that I started learning, I also started to look at some IP formulations to, to chance constraint uh, reformulations. Um, and, and so marrying a little bit also my IP background with, uh, with stochastic programming. Uh, and then uh, very recently, I started uh, also looking at uh, bi-level knapsack problems. Um, which is a, a Sigma two complete uh, hard problem, which is even harder than NP hard problems, <laughs> uh, which has been a fun experience as well to try to just uh, be able to solve like a really, really hard problem uh, computationally. Um, and that's, that's where I started to develop. And, and I think that's been my style uh, of research uh, from when I finished my PhD to these days, right? Mm -hmm. Just to, to start using uh, a little bit my comfort zone, but expanding it to try to go uh, to different areas and try to learn uh, different, uh, different content and different uh, experiences as well. Right. Solving uh, the, the chance constraint routing problem exactly is a super challenge. It is. It's it's very challenging, and and but it's also it was a really fun thing to do. It it uh, it gave uh, quite a few different ideas uh, that uh, that at least I feel that were really new that that probably can be applied also to uh, to other problems uh, that that I hadn't thought about before. Um, so I, I think that's that's where uh, where you can see like things coming together start trying to solve the problem uh the thing you're used to do doesn't work you have to adapt uh, and you adapt and you develop new things mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's to me the fun part of, of doing research yeah you mentioned the bi-level knapsack uh problem can you describe the problem uh, uh that you're actually trying to solve and you know maybe attract some students to work with you yeah, th this has been a, a, a very recent project uh, that I started uh, with uh, a PhD student uh, that my, that's currently studying with me. Uh, the problem essentially is uh, you have um, the basic idea of by levels that you have two levels of decision maker. Uh, the lower level decision maker has uh, essentially it's just a basic regular knapsack problem. Uh, the upper level decision maker has the chance to interdict the lower level. So uh, the lower level, the upper level decision maker takes it. This takes an item. If he takes an item, it's not available for the lower uh, level to pick. And the objective of the upper level guy is to just minimize uh, what the lower level guy could do. Uh, so it's like a min max problem mm -hmm. where uh, the objective is to hurt the your adversary uh, as much as you can. Uh, and it has applications uh, in, in economics and in defense and so on. Uh, so it's a very interesting problem to do. Uh, and, and we had to develop a completely new approach. All the previous approaches was actually based on solving MIPS. Uh, we devised a new algorithm that's essentially a branch and bound algorithm 
with some dynamic programming uh, type uh, structures and, and decisions. Uh, but it couldn't be straight up there because of the, of the, the complexity of the problem. Um, but we had to adapt it, and that's what allowed us to solve like sometimes two orders of magnitude faster than, than previous best approaches. So it's been a very fun project, and we're looking forward to seeing what else can we do with this type of approach. Uh, hopefully, we can do it uh, good impact in several similar problems as well. Right, well done. Uh, can you comment uh, about your experience working as associate editor for a number of important OR journals? Um, for example, how do you usually evaluate a paper? How do you handle conflicting reviews and so on? So uh, uh, it's been a great experience to me uh, to get a good uh, sense of the paper, a sense of contribution, a uh, sense of the field, what would be uh, interesting for people that are reading that particular journal, what is the right level. So it's been great to, to be able to contextualize uh, works and, and put things into perspective uh, besides just having the technical knowledge and, and being right, but also what does that mean for the field? Uh, so to develop this, this big picture uh, point of view was, was, uh, was a great experience. Uh, and it has been a great experience to, to be uh, associate editor for, for our journals. Um, it is sometimes tough, right, to, to handle conflicting uh, reviews. Uh, typically, I, I either look for a tiebreaker, which is a third reviewer, or sometimes I do that myself. Uh, sometimes I try to just see, okay, which are the points that are more relevant or not uh, from each review. Um, I typically try to err on the side of like giving the authors a chance if at least one of the reviewers says yes this thing is good this this is a good quality work um i would give the authors a chance to to respond to the negative review to see okay can you actually make yourselves better was it just that it wasn't well explained and so on um and, and that's typically how i try to handle these uh, these controversial decisions mm -hmm. uh so when considering the impact factor of theoretical and math-oriented journals, uh, as well as the H-index of researchers that work in such topics, one may find the absolute numbers a bit unfair compared to other applied fields. Does this bother you? Um, it bothers me a bit. Uh, I guess it doesn't bother me extremely, uh, maybe because uh, at least in my department, I was lucky enough, and I'm lucky enough to be in a department that's really focused uh, on just combinatorics and optimization. So uh, when I get evaluated and when I, when I get to talk to people, they really know uh, how to put these numbers into context. They don't, don't, don't just look at the raw numbers and say, okay, yeah, uh, index of 1.5 means something, right? They, they really know how to put things into perspective. Uh, but I also do think it's, it is unfair, uh, but it's, it's a bit of a necessary, uh, system because a lot of times it's hard to evaluate, uh, people when you're not in that field. Uh, so I think with, with anything, it is a number, it's something that gives you some information, uh, but just like any rankings, university rankings, any rankings that you put. Uh, that you put a score, uh, you always have to take that with a grain of salt. And to me, that, that's the part that bothers me more, is how these rankings are used, how these impact factors are used, uh, not the impact factors themselves. I think those are, are, are numbers that have some use uh, when you don't have any other information. Uh, the key thing is is to be able to use them right. I think that that's the key problem to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you had any negative experience, uh, for example, when applying for a grant or things like that, uh, because of this difference when you compare the, the numbers, uh, among or across different areas? 
Yeah, so to me, that that's why I'm saying I consider myself very lucky because I haven't had any of those experiences. Uh, it seems always from my department side, but also when I'm uh, getting grant uh, reports back that the people that did evaluate, they were at least knowledgeable enough that they, they, they knew about the area, they knew the importance and, 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 and things like that. Um, so I, I haven't had these negative experience. So, but I, yeah, I have heard of stories of people uh, with very negative experience in that. So I understand uh, some of the frustrations uh, that people have with that. But luckily, I, I didn't go through it through any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell me about your plans for the future. Uh, plans for the future. Uh, I think it's just to continue uh, having a, a great group uh, of students uh, trying to attract uh, great people to Waterloo. Uh, keep doing uh, a good computational work. Uh, keep trying to push the boundaries of what can be done uh, in terms of computations and try to see which harder problems uh, that we can solve. That's what I, I find fun when you're starting to, to do a different project and you start to pick a, a new problem uh, that some people would consider like really, really hard. And then all of a sudden uh, you get results that nobody expected. Uh, so it's just keep pushing the boundaries of, of what can be done uh, and, 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 and branching out uh, the same way that, that I've been doing. All right. Uh, so, Fuka, <laughs> uh, it was it was uh, fantastic to have this conversation with you. Uh, you were a uh, very inspiring person, um, and I mean, uh, it's it's nice that we're able to finally connect uh, uh, after all these years of knowing each other, but <laughs> only through the work or through uh, Ushua. And I mean, so thank you very much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for the invitation again. Uh, I think this is a, a great service uh, that, that you do for the whole community. Uh, it's been inspiring to see uh, a lot of different uh, testimonies and, and, and seeing the lives of the people uh, that you only know academically. So thank you very much as well. Yeah, that's, that's uh, very nice to hear. I appreciate uh, your support. And uh, when you're visiting Brazil, you can uh, maybe consider uh, taking a detour on the way back or when coming to, to stop by João Pessoa and, and meet our group. And maybe you can uh, even start a collaboration. So uh, you are most welcome to, to come here. Great. Thank you. It will be a pleasure to visit you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll take you up on that. Okay, Fuca, it was fantastic once again. So. See you soon and take care. Ciao. Bye. Thanks. Bye.